Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this Chatham House webinar on water and peace building in Iraq and Syria. I'm Glade Alan, I'm with the Energy, Environment and Resources Department at Chatham House and I, um, I have a great interest in the subject myself, I'm delighted to see how much interest there is on it at the moment. Um, the event is being held on the record and the webinar will be recorded. So we're delighted to welcome today two eminent experts who will discuss the subject of their recent paper for International Affairs Journal on an imperfect peace in the Euphrates Tigris River Basin. Um, they are Professor Aishagul Kibaroglu. She is the chair of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at MEF University in Istanbul, Turkey. And we have Dr. Ramazan Chaner Sayan, known as Chaner, um, and he is a postdoctoral fellow in water security at the United Nations University Institute for Water Environment and Health in Ontario. So thank you for joining us today. Um, as you know, these two rivers have enabled great civilizations in the region that, that now spreads across Iraq, Syria and Turkey. They provide energy and irrigation for crops and they've also been at the center of battles for control of territory um, very recently. So there's been a lot of emphasis on reduced water or mismanaged water leading to conflict around the world. But in our program, I mean, we're particularly interested in the opportunities that shared environments and ecosystems offer for peace building too. And especially in a time at which they're coming under such stress from increased use and degradation and climate change too. So we are going to um, turn to, to Aisha Gold first. Um, to begin uh, her presentation. Um, and you have around, you, the two of you have around around 20 minutes. Okay, over to you. Many thanks, Glada, for your kind introduction. Uh, and many thanks to the organizers at Chatham House for this opportunity to share our views expressed in our International Affairs article with such uh, distinguished uh, participants. And I will be explaining more about why we call it imperfect peace, but my introduction and my storyline narrative will also give some hints why we define Euphrates Tigris River Basin as a, a setting which consists of imperfect peace. Uh, so uh, transboundary water relations in this basin is often marked with political confrontations. And since the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and and since the beginning of unrest in Syria, transponder water relations have been pursued within the context of uh, a, a, a unstable international security environment, particularly with the emergence of non-state armed groups who used water as weapon. At the same time, however, cooperative mechanisms have also been initiated by riparian politicians, diplomats, waterline ministries, and uh, as well as informal and external actors. In our talk today, uh, we will examine the, these various emerging uh, mechanisms and actors operating in this imperfect peace setting. And we argue that their coexistence in the river basin demonstrates a case of Im imperfect peace. Uh, yeah, this is our river basin, uh, is one of the two main rivers of the Middle East or Southwest Asia, more correctly maybe in UN terms. And uh, you can see, uh, yeah, it's a very, uh, you know, pale map to show you the two rivers. And the 90% the of Euphrates originates in Turkey, uh, while Syria contributes 10%. And you can see Tigris, uh, you can see that they are originating very close to each other in Turkey. Uh, the geographers tell that there is 30 kilometer apart that they originate. Uh, so some parts of Tigris originate in Turkey, about 40% they say in the flow. And uh, the rest comes like 50, half of the flow comes from Iraq and 10% comes from Iran. Uh, so it's a quite significant river basin in terms of uh, kilometer squares, and there's a huge area in Iraq. And the waters of these two rivers are strategic for all riparians. Um, Iraq derives most of its surface freshwater resources from these two rivers. We can say that these are the two sources for Iraq. 
while in Syria it's one of seven river basins, but it is again very strategic because it's uh, very significant for agricultural and hydropower development in the country. In Turkey, Turkey has 25 river basins, but again, it's strategic and significant that one third of surface water comes from Euphrates and Tigris, and one fifth of the irrigable area in Turkey is situated in this uh, northern Mesopotamia in the basin. Uh, water question emerged in this basin uh, as a bone of contention as the right three major riparians started the major water land and resources development projects in the late 1960s so my timeline starts in the modern history and starts with the construction of these large-scale dams in the late 1960s at the same time let's go back to the 60s and remember that it is the height of the Cold War. And uh, that's why the political linkages established between transboundary water issues and non-site riparian security issues also exacerbated disagreements in water use and allocation. So there had been political rivalries among those three major riparians um, during the Cold War, and it prevented any fruitful cooperation from taking root. With Turkey remembering a member of NATO and Syria and Iraq allied with Soviet Union at that time, aggravated the water dispute. Uh, however, significantly when we look into water re relations, transponder water relations were particularly influenced with the dam building by the dam building and filling of the dams. So the first diplomatic crisis that I indicated here in, occurred in early 1970s or in mid 70s in 75, when the two dams in Syria and Turkey uh, constructed very close to each other in times of timing and in filling of the dams. And it caused a great anxiety in Iraq because the flow of the river changed during the filling of these giant dams, namely the Keban Dam in Turkey and Tapka Dam in Syria. So it caused a diplomatic crisis and it caused more than a diplomatic crisis. Actually, we remember Saddam uh, sending his troops to the Syri uh, Syrian board, uh, border. However, when we analyze this crisis, uh, we know that this crisis, uh, the main cause of this crisis was the mounting political rivalry and tension between two Baathist regimes. So it was not only division between, you know, the East and the West bloc between Turkey and Iraq and Syria, but two Baathist regimes were also in rivalry and it, uh, and it was a water, it was not a water sharing crisis per se, but rather the beginning of the use of water as a political lever in non riparian issues. Uh, the accelerated development of the Euphrates in the 1980s by Turkey and Syria, building the Tapka and Euphrates Valley project, and in Turkey, building the series of dams, it caused significant anxiety in Iraq, and Iraq called for a establishment of a permanent me mechanism to exchange uh, information regarding the dams, the new dams coming to the region. And Turkey agreed, and this, is that, this institution is called Joint Technical Committee, and it was first a bilateral one, uh, quickly in, joined by Syria, and it became a trilateral uh, formal uh, official institution to discuss especially major development projects. However, uh, even though this institution, which I give great importance because this is the only institution which brings together riparian officials, or could be also informal figures as well, but not so far, uh, they, it didn't perf uh, perform very, very successfully because the riparians themselves did not uh, empower joint technical committee with clear and jointly agreed mandate. The major question was to discuss whether Euphrates and Tigris together, which Turkey was in favor as a single basin, or where Iraq and Syria was insisting that the joint technical committee should be busy with discussing only Euphrates, while Iraq and Syria was insisting on immediate sharing agreement, Turkey was insisting that first the river basin should be studied, water and land resources should be uh, investigated, and then allocation should be done uh, after these studies. Meanwhile, in, in the 1980s, again, we see the, we, uh, the emergence of two protocols, two water allocation agreements, uh, which uh, came to uh, realization by the 
uh, after several high level meetings of top officials. So the agreements were not the product of joint technical committee. Uh, the politicians at the highest level signed these treaties, one between Turkey and Syria in 1987, uh, which Tur through which Turkey promised almost half of the Euphrates fall at the Turkey Syrian border. Uh, with the intention of reaching an agreement with Syria on security matters. Uh, and the other one between Iraq and Syria, where Iraq's share was designated as 58%, uh, the, the one here, and the Syria as 42%. So those agreements should be sparking question marks in your mind. Well, how come they signed these agreements? How come Iraq, uh, how come Syria agreed with 48, 42%. How come Turkey agreed to give half of the Euphrates? But I should underline the fact that all riparians signing these agreements, they added the fact that these are interim agreements, temporary agreements. The final allocation agreements should be done on a territorial basis. So there was no timeline, but it was considered as an interim agreement. And as, as academics and researchers, when we analyze these agreements, uh, we find many short shortcomings, loopholes and pitfalls really because agreements do not uh, consider good water governance. They don't take care of water quality management or stakeholder engagement or environmental protection. Maybe more importantly in the 1980s with the revision of the hydraulic mission, they even did not uh, uh, address to the fluctuations in flow, meaning that they contain no clauses referring to periods of drought that occur frequently in the basin and cause drastic changes in the flow regime, which needs adjustments. And in the agreements, there was no reference to the drought. So it was shared in terms of cubic meters or in percentages without reference to the frequently occurring droughts. Then I go quickly uh, fast forward to the 2000s. Uh, 2000 significant political changes have taken place in the basin since the early 2000s, bringing new actors, new uh, processes into the imperfect peace that we claim in the area. US invasion of Iraq in 2003 had drastic implications for water policy and management in the country, in my opinion, complicating the realm of transponder water relations. Uh, following the invasion of Iraq, U.S. State Department, uh, Corps of Engineers, uh, USAID, and a number of U.S. research and education institutions played significant roles in the reformulation of water policy and management in Iraq. In the south, uh, the rehabilitation of marshlands, and in the north, new water resources projects uh, moved out high up on the agenda. And the prevailing view adopted by US institutions was that a planning and management as a single river basin in the, in the ET basin required gathering of information, uh, water flow particularly, but also gathering of information concerning the operation of the dams, which started to be realized and which became operational by the 2000s, a series of dams in Turkey, Syria, and as well as Iraq. So the American authorities wanted to, from Turkey and possibly from Syria, the operation uh, clauses of the dams. Yet uh, they couldn't accomplish this aim. Uh, the aspirations were not realized because uh, the Turkish authorities uh, were claiming that there was no you know, atmosphere in, the, in, in Iraq under invasion. And, so, and there should, there, they have to revitalize joint technical committee. They have to revitalize the dialogue in order to start such negotiations. Uh, and so the aspirations of the U.S. institutions not realized, and to date, in my opinion, the you know, U.S. institutions' design of an inter intervention in Iraqi water policies have not produced any tangible results in respect of effective and equitable water management at either national or international level. Uh, in the other side of the coin, the positive developments were developing uh, re because the regime change in Iraq also provides uh, opportunities for Iraqi, uh, Iraqi experts, professionals, uh, even active uh, diplomats, politicians, uh, to interact with Turkey and Syria more regularly. And this produced some, a bunch of track to diplomacy initiatives. And as a result, for instance, in 2005, Euphrates Tigers Initiative for Cooperation was established between uh, Iraq, Syria, uh, and Turkey as an informal initiative, as a track two initiative. 
uh, between the former diplomats or former uh, water uh, engineers and academics and researchers. And ITIC was trying to conduct its activities in terms of trainings or research in the midst of the conflict, first in Iraq and then in Syria. And it was trying to carry out its activities uh, on non-contentious issues like uh, the common problems like dam safety, uh, hydrology of the river and other issues. Other science policy initiatives also try to strive in the region all through these uh, uh, difficult times since 2003. And uh, the one could be referred as collaborative program Euphrates and Tigris call itself a science policy initiative. Uh, at that time, Syria could not join because the conflict in Syria started. So it's composed of mostly Iran, Iraq and Turkey and international agencies, research institutes. And another major initiative, which lasted like more than a decade, the so-called Blue Peace Initiative as a track to again um, in the Middle East, uh, it accomplished to bring together uh, various um, various uh, members of different communities that not, not only politicians or former parliamentarians or active uh, ministers, but also journalists and academics. And another good news about Blue Peace in the in the Middle East initiative, which was uh, initiated by Strategic Foresight Group and which was uh, sponsored by international agencies like uh, Swiss and Swedish development agencies, they also managed to convince the riparians to turn this initiative in 2018 as a permanent body, uh, as a coordination, established a regional center and a coordination office is operating right now in Turkey, could be transferred to other countries because it's composed of Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, and Jordan and Lebanon. So there are uh, there is this Middle East perspective in this initiative. And another positive development in the 2000s, how come it happened in the first decade of 2000s, uh, the, that the transboundary relations evolved from hostile to cooperative because political will expressed at the highest level at the decision-making level pro, uh, uh, provided a very important contribution to these cooperative frameworks. However, voter bureaucracies also uh, had a very significant role in this uh, decade between 2000 and 2011 to realize um, protocols on water between Turkey, Syria, Turkey, Iraq, numerous protocols also referring to uh, voter relations. And uh, that, the, 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 this was the years of you know, trying to uh, bring Middle East a common zone uh, inspired from you know, back in the European communities and trying to figure out how security, energy and investment can be you know, re revitalized and can be combined not only between Turkey, Syria and Iraq, but also definitely Lebanon, Jordan as well. And, uh, and series of protocols were uh, signed uh, on bilateral basis uh, and they they were concerned with uh, in contrast with the ones in 1980s like the one i mentioned between turkey syria dividing the river uh, of euphrates and the one between turkey and iraq these protocols of the 2009 uh, they they referred mostly to the what the levels and patterns of water management and use in the basin so they were concerned with drought management they were concerned with water quality remediation and modernization of irrigation. They were concerned with building joint dam between Turkey and Syria on the Orontes River, unimaginable because for long, for decades, Syria never recognized Orontes, uh, the Turkey-Syria border over Orontes, as you remember. But with this joint dam development uh, in 2009, implicitly Syria recognized and it was actually the dam was uh, the foundation stones were laid. Uh, even the foundation stones were for the dam were laid on the Orontes River in 2011 in February, uh, just before the domestic unrest broke out in Syria. So, the, so dam could not be realized definitely, but the but the idea was great and it officially it was agreed. Uh, yeah, the uh, and. Those protocols could not be realized, as we know, because the because the the relations between the two any 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 pair of the riparians worsened, and also the regional instability was again over, 
uh, and because of the Syrian conflict starting and other conflicts or, or their continuing. However, uh, the, the riparians, especially on the Turkish Iraq track, I, as I try to define, try to try to strive in these difficult times of after 2011. And Turkey Iraq side officially at the ministerial level, water ministries or environment ministries come together to sign another protocol to discuss about joint water issues in 2014. And in our opinion, they were inspired by the track to initiatives that I mentioned as well, because they were meeting under the skirts of these initiatives meetings. And however, another significant development, which I mentioned in the introduction of my speech that these, this rapprochement between Turkey and Iraq, starting by 2014, going on and off uh, since then, the, it couldn't address to the major rising issue in the region that the, that the non-state armed groups were con started to control water resources in Syria after Iraq, and they were actually acting like, uh, you know, illegal actors to control water, to destroy water-related infrastructure, or what use water as an instrument to punish the uh, punish the, the states or the communities, or at the same time, the ISIS was also trying to keep the image itself as a jihadist state-like entity, and was also interested in taking over state functions by providing water services. So between 2014 and 2018, ISIS uh, controlled water. And, uh, and also uh, very much uh, damaged the infrastructure and people's uh, livelihoods, but also trying to create an image of state and trying to provide them water services. Yeah, ISIS may no, no longer pose a threat in this region, not a significant one at least, luckily. However, after the defeat of ISIS, other non-state armed groups are affiliated with uh, PKK or Al-Qaeda, took over some dams in Syria in the last couple of years, and they are gaining control of hydropower development and flow of water to the irrigation lands. So if they, these groups were to gain more access to more territory, they could adopt the tactics used by ISIS, because unfortunately it was uh, for some certain period of time, ISIS really practiced this. So uh, the, that's why we suggest we have some policy recommendations in our article. So it's not that uh, we can make it realized by the officials and by the politicians uh, of the riparian states, but we keep insisting on these suggestions. And we, we, we keep stating that the riparian states should need to establish regional security arrangements in order to preserve and protect their resources and also the, the infrastructure, namely the dams, because they were controlled and it was the horrible years for the people living in the midst of this conflict. Uh, so I will end up with this policy recommendation by focusing on the the so-called joint security mechanisms that we developed through brainstorming in around the uh, Blue Peace meetings. And so th these are only suggestions. And I keep saying that the, those uh, mechanisms should be established and, and, uh, and the existing institutions like Joint Technical Committee, it worked on and off, but it is still vital and it's still uh, valid by the right parents. And it was functional in the early 2000s when the relations were very good in the heydays of good relations. So I believe that the Joint Technical Committee could be considered uh, as a forum by the riparians as an effect, it can play an effective role uh, to ensure political commitment to pro for protection of water supply. And uh, because we, we just had some, you know, visits to the other parts of the world and saw that, for instance, in Senegal River Basin, when the riparians in Senegal River, when they had, uh, quite uh, hot conflicts, armed conflicts, they managed to establish the River Basin Authority and they managed to function this authority amid these conflicts and they uh, managed to keep the dialogue about water relations. So that inspiration has drawn us to make such a suggestion. Uh, another suggestion is that the riparians in our opinion should really work and find out uh, the individually or collectively 
assessing the threats to the water infrastructure because they were caught very unprepared when ISIS controlled series of dams in Iraq and Syria. So these early warning mechanisms should be established preferably at transboundary level and the vulnerability landscaping should be done. So where, where is vulnerable, where is critical? Most of the things are of course in this stage and, uh, and preferably this should be done uh, together. And they, this study could be, a, could be a very good confidence building measure between the riparians uh, and it could be an integral part of environmental peace building in the region if they pay attention to this. Uh, another suggestion is again to uh, make a list of critical water related infrastructure, make a joint inventory. Of course, it's very tricky because uh, maybe the riparians most probably they wouldn't like to give up from their uh, sovereignty and jurisdictional rights and share this knowledge. And this list could be quite tricky uh, to, should, could be also obtained by the non-state armed groups, so it, it should be taken and handled with very much care. But the, those are the ideas which ju we just uh, worked on in order for to prepare the riparian uh, politicians to the idea that uh, the danger is not over, ISIS maybe uh, has a very limited power in the region or it's no more a concern, but other actors are there and they can also imitate what ISIS did. And it would be great for these mechanisms uh, to be established or joint technical committee could be used as a platform and can regulate security in interdependencies and also can foster cooperation around transponder water issues. So, and then I will, uh, yeah, I will give the floor to Janel and he will elaborate on how we are inspired with this concept and, you know, and end up with our uh, theoretical and conceptual uh, few conclusions. Over to you, Janel. Thank you very much, Professor Kibarulu. And I would like to thank to Chatham House for giving this opportunity for us to make this presentation in such a distinguished environment. So as Professor Kibarol indicated, despite the lack of harmonious relations and political stability in the basin, a certain degree of interactions over Euphrates Tigris River has been present. For example, in the absence of a multilateral water sharing treaty, concerned actors have maintained uh, cooperation through several joint mechanisms, including bilateral protocols, memorandum of understandings, joint technical committee, high level strategic councils, and track to diplomacy tools. Therefore, Professor Kiborol clearly demonstrated that peaceful interactions between competing actors can still occur in the middle of major conflicts and wars, and even in a highly stable region like Euphrates and Tigris. So basically, this brings us to the theoretical framework of this article, which is basically inspired from the concept of imperfect peace and intends to contribute into environmental peace building literature. So basically, imperfect peace is a highly philosophical construct proposed by Spanish philosopher Francesco Munoz. According to Munoz, once we speak about peace, we either tend to idealize it by, um, by focusing on conditions when, where there is no structural violence or social injustices with fully functioning political and legal institutions, or simply we, take, we simply take peace as, a, as, as absence of wars and conflicts, which are respectively known as positive and negative peace in the peace studies literature. So however, as, as Munoz claims, peace is an unfinished road, a process. Even in the most democratic societies, he claims, we cannot talk about full elimination of social injustices or structural inequalities. That's why peace is characteristically imperfect according to his, un his understanding. He further claims that even in a highly conflicted cases, there can still be moments where, <clears throat> where conflict, conflicting parties may engage in peaceful interaction. For example, few scholars use this understanding to show the emergence of civil society organizations during the Syrian civil war, where a fully, in, fully independent civil society was almost non-existent uh, before the civil war. So Munoz highlights that we should recognize uh, and acknowledge peaceful interactions occurring in conflictive environments as they are still important to provide basic human needs. So we argue that this understanding of imperfect peace uh, may well contribute to the environmental peace building literature. Environmental peace building literature in its, in its essence asserts that 
Conflicting parties tend to cooperate over transboundary natural resources as cooperation is more advantageous for all the parties. Scholars widely demonstrated that there is more cooperation than conflict over natural resources if we look at the world history. <clears throat> the concept is very optimistic though, once claiming that cooperation over natural resources is likely to spill over towards the other policy domains and transform the relations between conflicting parties into, into a peaceful one. In other words, this potential spillover is one of the objectives of the environmental peace building concept. However, the Euphrates Tigris case holds element, elements from the both understandings. On one hand, if we talk in the context of environmental peace building, we can view these interactions and mechanisms as the beginning of broader cooperation if we want to be optimistic about the case. However, once we look at the historical evolution of the case, despite a certain degree of peaceful interactions and cooperative mechanisms at the basin, we never come close to inclusive multilateral water institutions or a permanent state of harmonious relations in the basin. Despite all the tensions, on the other hand, we also have, haven't witnessed any direct conflict or war over water resources in the basin. Thus, imperfect peace enables us to perceive peace as an unfinished process, as Munoz states that peace is characteristically imperfect because we always coexist with conflict and violence. So our article basically calls for environment, calls environmental peace building literature to tone down its optimism to search for the spillover towards other policy domains in a way to transform, transform hostile relations into harmonious ones. And we simply demonstrated that peace is inherently imperfect and peaceful interactions may still happen without transforming, <clears throat> without transforming into broader co cooperation as analyzed through, the, through this case study. So thank you very much. I think it's all I can say at this stage. Okay, I stop sharing it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Aishagul and uh, Chaner. Thank you very much for somehow covering 60 years of history um, of, of diplomatic relations across the basin in, in the last 30 minutes. Um, so I'm going to turn to Dr. Azam Alawash, um, who has joined us today from Iraq. He's founder and CEO of Nature Iraq. He's also founder of the Twin Rivers Institute for Scientific Research at the American University of Iraq in Soleimi. Um, Azam, maybe I can field you one of the questions that has come through from, um, from a participant here. Saleh Kamel Saleh has asked, is it conceivable that the positive sum of community interests will ever be adopted by riparians to benefit from the two rivers? And if yes, how? And if no, what are the obstacles? Great question. Um, let's see, history matters in this part of the world. Uh, the timeline goes before 1960, uh, when Iraq, Iran, and Turkey, and Pakistan had CENTO. CENTO was a friendship treaty, self-defense treaty, common defense treaty. Um, at that point in time, the political, geopolitical conditions allowed for that kind of cooperation. Today, what we have is totally different than it was. Uh, Aisha Gul uh, mentioned this, the Cold War, uh, and uh, we are still uh, uh, in a small regional Cold War called uh, basically the Turkish uh, and the Iranians uh, and formerly Iraq uh, were, were competing for, for, uh, for dominance. Um, and so when you're reviewing the history of the political uh, uh, discussions that, that uh, Aisha Gul was, was going through, we need to remember that the, the atmosphere had these Cold War uh, uh, effects on, on the relationship. And today what we have is Iran and Turkey vying for uh, uh, influence and Iraq is basically um, trying to figure out its way forward. That said, the, the peace, the imperfect peace that you guys are talking about, the road of it, and I, I believe that you're right. And in fact, it is a process, but the road ahead is gonna get worse. Uh, simply in Iraq, uh, today we are 43 million by, uh, by, by 2030, that's 10 years from now, we will be 50 million. By 2050, we're predicted to come to 80 million people i.e. the demand is increasing. At the same time, oil is going to lose its value. The demand is, is going to decrease. So 
we are facing a very tough road ahead in Iraq. And of course, that's going to have spillover effects both on Iran and Turkey. So going back to the question is, can, can, can these uh, communities come together and and, and, and for the common, uh, manage the Tigris and Euphrates for the common benefit. I believe, and I've said this before in various papers, that the, the, this problem, this, this upcoming water, not crisis, is going to be a water bankruptcy with climate change effects and, all, and the population increases, are, is going to be an opportunity to enhance that imperfect peace. We will not never come to a perfect harmony. Even the European Union is not in perfect harmony. But I suggest to everybody here and to your audience that in fact, this crisis, this bankruptcy may actually be the key to enhance um, or to come to an agreement uh, on the water management together. Let me tell you from the perspective of Iraq. Iraq water management history is based on flood control. Flood control, not management of rare resources. And, but this has changed over the last 30 years, 40 years, from, from a, an abundance of water to a lack of water because of the dams upstream, because of the lack of increase, because a lot, there's a lot of causes. I don't want to look backwards. I want to look forward and how to make this water management a key for cooperation between Iran, Turkey, and Iraq, and Syria. Uh, and I've suggested that, in fact, Iraq can use Turkish infrastructure, for example, to store the water that right now it stores in flood control structures. Thirthar, Thirthar Depression, for example, if you go to the, to the map that, that, that uh, Aisha Gul showed, is 50 billion cubic meters, it loses by itself about seven and a half billion cubic meters of, of water a year to evaporation. Seven and a half billion, that's not seven and a half million, that's, 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 that's more than the water budget of, of entire countries. If we come to an agreement on how we can store this water in Turkish infrastructure, we can make seven, eight billion cubic meters available for the benefit of the environment, for the benefit of both countries. What is missing is trust. Even when I, Aisha Gold mentions something as simple as the Euphrates Tigris Basin, Iraqis don't accept that. Iraq says Euphrates is one river, the Tigris is one river, don't be mixing them as one as, as one on one on one basin. The level of distrust is that it's even at the at the nomenclature that we use to describe physical phenomena. Turkey says we are releasing 700 cubic meters per, per second on average. Iraqi says, no way you're doing that. There is no trust. There is no trust. And so um, and I don't want to waste all, all your time. I, the, the technical conditions, the technical solutions are very simple and very much available. It is going to be built on common water management of the water resources. It is also uh, 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 include uh, management of energy, i.e. electricity. We can, we can have photovoltaic cells in southern Iraq that can feed the, the, the grid that connects Turkey, Iraq, and Iran with electricity during the day, and we can use extra electricity to return the waters to the, to the dams in a battery kind of fashion, and then use hydroelectricity to, to feed the network. There's, there's plenty, plenty of ideas, and I've published those, and we've published those in, in many papers. What is missing is political will. President Erdogan, the last couple of times met, that has met with the Prime Minister of Iraq and the President of Iraq, indicated that he wants this water file to be to be done, to be, to, be, to be finished. No progress has happened. Why? Um, that's a question that I will leave without answer. The, the, the point is right now we are going through a dance between the various regional powers on, on who is in control, uh, but there is a crisis coming up and I can see it in 10 years from now when oil prices are going down and Iraq's population is increasing and we can no longer kick this uh, uh, solution down, down the road. And the time to work is right now and the time to come to an agreement is right now. Um, but we shall see whether the politicians will heed our words of, of uh, warning or not. Thank you so much, Dr. Azam, and, and thanks for opening our eyes to some of those innovative solutions that could help us to overcome this idea of a zero-sum 
a zero sum concept of water sharing, um, but also about be very realistic about the lack of trust. Now we have a lot of questions, which is great to see. Um, and I hope that we can use the next 20 minutes to get through as many as we can. Um, we have quite a few questions about Syria. So I'm going to start with that. Um, uh, for example, um, Bala Nishant so mentions that there, there is 10,000 Islamic State militants are still present in Syria. Um, George de Corsi Wheeler uh, says, please comment on how the lack of sufficient water for farming destroyed the Syrian agrarian economy and resulted in the Syrian refugee crisis, if, if indeed you uh, adopt that view. Um, uh, there are a couple of other questions about, um, about conflict and the way that water has played into that conflict. So if anybody would like to comment on um, Syria, please do. Yes, Dr. Azam. Uh, the Syrian crisis is an interesting preview to what I'm talking about as a preview for what's gonna happen in Iraq in 10 years, in 15 years, when the number of the population increases and there is no, not enough uh, income from oil to feed the people. The refugee problem exists in Syria, and I, I moved it to Iraq simply because I have an Iraqi context, but I'm telling you what happened is a simple preview to what is gonna happen if we don't address this issue. I completely support the idea that, in fact, the, 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 the problems in Turkey began, in Syria began with, with farmers demonstrating. Uh, and then it, 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 it basically exploded as a, as a result of uh, uh, um, nobody paying attention to, to the plight of people. Um, what is the solution? I keep on saying, is it going to be more water? Is water going to um, help the people get more settled? I, I am convinced that the basic problem in Southern Iraq in Syria probably, is that we are using still the Sumerian method of agriculture. The Sumerian method of agriculture is just flood agriculture. A lot, of the, a lot of the water is being lost and it wasn't a problem. The Sumerian method of agriculture lasted for 8,000 years with, flood, with, flood, with flooding coming every year, but the flooding was part of the solution why, why agriculture has lasted so long. You see the flood comes in and it washes away the salt that, that accumulates from evaporation for the year before. It deposits a layer of silt and clay on top of soil. And, and, and that's how the system worked for thousands of years. Floods are no longer happening and therefore agricultural land are, are, uh, are losing their, their uh, uh, fertility due to salinization. Areas that were higher than the rivers in, in previous history used to be fed with rainwater due to the presence of diesel generators and electricity, these, these lands that used to be fed with rainwater, pure rainwater, are now being fed in flood irrigation method because of cheap water. And that is causing a long-term problem because in fact, lands are getting lost to salinization. So the solution is to modernize irrigation, modernize agriculture. But how are we gonna do that in two countries, Turkey and Iraq namely, uh, sorry, Syria and Iraq, that, uh, uh, that have different, uh, different political agendas. But the solutions are available. Technically, it's available. All we need is the political will and the political vision to, 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 to implement methods that will save water, will make more water available for the entire uh, future generations. Thank you. Um, Khaled Shahabi has also asked, how committed was Turkey to the JTCs and the MOU agreements as Iraq and Syria went through their respective internal and external stripes. I think that's one for you, Ajgul. Um, yeah. but you might want to comment on Syria too. Yeah, that's a very interesting, good question because Turkey is upstream and how come she was convinced to sign such uh, protocols? And actually Turkey initiated this uh, memorandum of understanding in 2000, in the first decade of 2000s, or how come Iraq invited Turkey in back in 1980s and Turkey agreed to 
establish joint technical committee because this is not a typical behavior of an uh, upstream country which controls the water resources and uh, which may actually finish its water development structures without a much uh, you know, dialogue from its neighbors. This is the idea of the realist or water wars literature, thinking that the upstream countries will dominate. So the reality shows us that even though they are core realists, but I think we will be more realist that uh, Turkey has a comprehensive relation with Iraq and Syria, though Cold War marked these relations, but especially with Iraq, Turkey had very important economic relations, trade relations, and Turkey was eager to flourish its relations with Iraq. And during the Cold War, it was difficult with Syria and Assad regime was supporting, according to the Turkish officials, the uh, terrorist groups in Syria, and there were also territorial claims. So there were thorny issues with Syria, but Turkey was open to dialogue. How committed she was, uh, I, I have been working on a book lately trying to define Turkish water diplomacy, and I've been interviewing and analyzing primary resources to understand Turkish perspective, how committed she was and why she initiated not only joining the Joint Technical Committee, but three-stage plan as well. Back in the 1980s, Turkey proposed to the riparians to study the river basin as a whole, water and land resources, and then it reaching an allocation agreement. I think she was committed because the engineers were, uh, Turkish engineers uh, were uh, keen on the idea and also uh, working with politicians. And interestingly, Turkish politicians were engineers, as you know, the, these famous uh, old politicians, they were the cr creators of the Turkish Water Authority, like Süleyman Demirel, like Turgut Özal. And they were eager with the idea that the water resources of Euphrates and Tigris as a single basin is really could be sufficient without knowing the impact of climate change at that time, uh, but also very optimistic of the idea that it could be sufficient for the riparians. So Turkey was eager to come to the diplomacy table and discuss about how to uh, allocate this resource. So Turkey formed joint technical committee and also other memoranda as a means of dialogue, trust building, and also to start uh, to harmonize water management and use structures. Because as we analyze the three riparians, yes, they are not uh, exercising very well the effective water management. There are also very, very much differences between their water institutions, water management styles, even uh, the measurement of data. So there, there, there was so much need to harmonize, starting with data exchange, but also the other water management patterns and uses, as I do. That's why the latest memoranda was, uh, was focused on this idea, how to manage irrigation water, how to manage droughts, and how to deal with, um, in a way, uh, dam building, because three riparians are eager to build the dams. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think Turkey was committed if she received a positive signal about the three-stage plan or continuation. And Turkey was committed that she also uh, passed these protocols through the parliament. And it was, uh, Iraq was hesitant to pass the protocol in the parliament. There were uh, rejections in the Iraqi parliament. Uh, regarding the uh, protocol in 2009, because some of the parliamentarians in Iraq wanted first the sharing agreement and then uh, talking about how to use water. Yeah, my experience tells me that Turkey took the risk and if they had come to the serious table and implement the protocols or treaties, uh, yeah, it would be, have been implemented, but maybe it would been, have been better. Thank you, Ajgul. Um, I have a kind of a follow-up question since you mentioned the management of dams. Um, Katharina Schmitz asks, is there a chance for joint management, for example, of dams to increase confidence building and peace building like in the South uh, Caucasus, Caucasus um, Nguri? Uh, also, we've heard a lot about top-down decisions and diplomatic agreements. However, I wonder whether there are local and civil society initiatives. Yeah. Great question again. Um, I am quite optimistic about this idea because uh, all riparians have experience to work with their neighbors to, uh, to work on the dams, especially Turkish experience with Armenia. 
You know, everybody knows that Turkish-Armenian relations, unfortunately, could not be officially settled. But since the Soviet times, Turkey-Armenia jointly built a dam on the border, and they are operating this dam on the border. And also Turkey has been uh, keen when, when the relations with Syria improved due to other political impacts or influences in early 2000s, and it also reflected in water relations. The first suggestion by Turkey is to build a joint dam on the Orontes River because Turkey is the downstream there and it needed the dam, but she was able to convince the Syrian counterparts. It was good. And also Syrians agreed that this dam could be a symbol of cooperation and also in the benefit of both sides, maybe more for Turkey because it will be controlling the floods for which was a problem for many years in the Orontes River. And back in the 1970s, again, through the primary sources that I looked into, there were in the joint technical committee meetings when they tried to talk about something really bringing fruitful results or something which is constructive, uh, the parties to the meetings, diplomats and also technocrats, they were talking about how to build a joint dam on the Tigris border, uh, on the Euphrates border between Syria and Turkey. And Turkish engineers were uh, suggesting that a joint dam on the border, a one dam could be a better solution than building two large dams right on the Turkish side and the Syrian side. Today we have two large dams, Karkamush, and uh, Tishrin dams. Well, once, one, once upon a time in the 1980s, Turkish engineers suggested that one dam on the border could be a good symbol because we manage with Armenia, we can manage with you as well, and this will be more useful and it will be maybe even they thought about less social and environmental impacts. It was not considered, but as soon as uh, the relations repaired, uh, due to the other uh, political rapprochement between Turkey and Syria, especially, uh, joint dam building uh, became a really a good area for cooperation. And that's why we are inspired from this. If it can continue here and there between Turkey and Iraq as well, it can be a part of cooperation. Of course, the environmentalists and other, uh, other NGOs and also professionals would agree against dam building, continuously dam building, and they, are, they have very convincing points, uh, but this is the reality. I mean, those all three, those riparians are keen to build more dams, either in Northern Iraq or in Southern Turkey, or if possible in Syria, um, uh, they, they are keen to increase the dams. So it could be an area whenever it is possible, as we call it, it is imperfect peace. We cannot wait for a perfect peace. So it's uh, Turkey Iraq track is going on, on and off. We hear sometimes very positive uh, news about at the highest political level uh, regarding economic and political cooperation. Sometimes we also hear about threatening words between the high level politicians, but it is going on. And, there it, and I believe in Turkey Iraq track because economies are complementary and we used to have billions of trade volume and we are trying to repair this after the sanctions, invasion, and so forth. So lately, there is an intention to go back to these good days of billions of trade volume between Turkey and Iraq. So I, I, that's why I believe this, will, this can reflect in good water relations as well. Thank you. I have a couple of questions here about the way that water is allocated within um, the different regions, and maybe this is one for, for Dr. Azam as well. Um, so Kamil Market asks, how, how, is, how is the base of water allocated within each, uh, each of the countries? And uh, Sumer Vakur asks, uh, can you elaborate on the evaporation problem in the lower segments of the basin and how Syria and Iraq uh, can correct the inefficient water infrastructure, which wastes enormous amounts of water at the expense of all basin countries. And I think this ties in with a question um, uh, posed to you, Dr. Azam, from Carol Shoshani Sherfan, on um, how can a water energy food nexus approach improve cooperation? Who do you want to handle? Uh, <laughs> um, you can, you can just. I mean, we have. I'm trying to group them a little because I'm very aware of the time. So if you choose the part you want to answer, that's fine. Right. For the so, others, just uh, raise your hand if you want to to comment. With me, uh, the problem, of course, is that we base our projection of water based on rainfall and whatever is in the dams, 
uh, at least in the Iraq, and then there's a plan that comes out and, and basically they decide how much water to allocate to different regions uh, for what kind of uh, product. Uh, the problem, of course, is because you have a uh, you have a problem between um, the different regions. Uh, the upstream always takes more water than they are uh, uh, allowed, and we frequently have problems between between uh, regions. Um, Iraq, uh, look, uh, with Aisha, I don't. Dams is not the solution. Uh, we don't need more dams. We need more dams, like we need a, a, a bullet in the head. We don't need. We have more storage capacity than 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 we need. What we need is trust in each other. Now, if trust is not available. What you can do is, but this is the, the answer on, on the issue of the waters. Iraq evaporation rates is between three and a half meters per year in the south to about two and a half meters in the north. That is, if you have a lake, take Thabthar, for example. Thabthar has 7,500 square kilometers surface area. Multiply by that by three, you'll have seven and a half billion. Uh, you, you, lose, you, lose, you lose, sorry, what did I say? It's 30, it's 3,500 square kilometers. Multiply that by three. Uh, uh, in Turkey, the evaporation is quite a lot less because they're further up north and the storage is in the mountains. So you take a quantity of water, you store it in Iraq, you lose 8 billion, you can put that same water in infrastructure in the north, in, in Turkey, and you'll save that much water and you can, you can release it if you can agree on operation rules for the dams. Now, some people accuse me of saying you're putting Iraq's future strategic interest in the hands of the Turks. I tell them I am not giving them anything they don't have right now. If Turks are intended to cut off water from Iraq, they can do it for three, four years until their dams are full. So, so this, is a, this is a fictitious issue. But also we can create pressure on, on Turkey by giving, in exchange for leasing space in Turkish dams for storing water, we can give them access to the Gulf for transit. Turkey is looking for more markets for this product. The Gulf is right there. They can pass their trucks to Iraq. They don't give us water, we don't allow them passageways. So there's mutual interest. Create those mutual interest bonds, and then you can have that, 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 that trust that is needed for, for the long term. And for the doubters, I submit to you that you in Europe had to go through two world wars of comp of comp because of competition, and then you realize war is not the answer. Maybe cooperation, economic cooperation is the answer. Well, we don't need to learn that lesson. We can read history. And we can get to a, to a point where, in fact, we can build cooperation across borders through management of water together. Um, Let's hope so. Um, Chaner, I thought maybe it's good to bring you in on the questions about third parties. Um, there's a few questions about um, whether the UN has responded to the issue, you know, and, and, and how, and whether the EU can play a role. Um, in water diplomacy in the region, um, or you know, or other states outside of um, of, of the three that we're discussing. Um, to my knowledge, actually, I mean, UN didn't have any tangible steps to intervene in this process. If I mean, Pro Professor Kibaro, please intervene if you think that it's a I mean, wrong answer. I don't know. Uh, and also, I again, I mean, to my knowledge, as Professor Kibaro indicated during this presentation, EU involvement actually maybe counted under the blue initiative maybe I mean I don't I don't know if we can make it in that way or I mean I really yeah. I mean this is these are the things which I think but I mean I see a question about the international water law I mean if you talk about the third third parties and stuff I mean this is a kind of tricky issue in this case again because I mean as known I mean there's a UN convention on water in, uh, transboundary water management actually and also U UNEC has similar convention but the Turkish perception on the convention actually makes it a little bit uh, problematic to in, uh, apply international water law in because Turkey is not uh, Turkey hasn't signed or ratified the agreement although Syria and Iraq are part of the agreement which basically makes Turkey kind of, I mean, non-responsible for the convention. So that's why I mean, it also kind of prevents, uh, pre prevents impl implementation of international law in the region, I can say. 
Uh, can I have a follow up on that mm -hmm. specific one? Look, Turkey is very smart. They're not, they haven't signed the treaty. I understand that. But they have been very careful about observing the rules of that treaty. Two, mm -hmm. two, two branches, do no harm and equitable use. And what they're saying, Iraq is overusing the water. Iraq's position is this is our historic right. We have, the, we have clay tablets from 3500 BC that proves we are the first developers of the water resources. And frankly, Iraq is not going to change its position. Neither is Turkey going to change its position. But when it came, when time came, when push came to shove, Turkey actually proved by action that they intend no harm by delaying the filling of Aliso Dam upon, upon the request of Iraq. So Turkey is very smart. Turkey is not, uh, uh, they're not juniors. They're not, they're, they're, they know what they're doing. Uh, uh, but the problem is that if Iraq continues its position, we're going to go nowhere. We're going to just basically repeating our position. This is our historic right. And Turkey is saying, well, OK, fine, we're upstream. We'll do whatever we want. We need to change the discussion. We need to change the language from whose water this is to how we can cooperate to help our people. And me as an NGO, I can say that, uh, but I'm not in a political decision maker. Uh, I can advise. I can talk. I can, I can plead. Uh, but until the politicians have that gumption, the, 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 the incentive to reach an agreement, uh, uh, we're gonna go nowhere. But our job as NGOs, as, as academics, is to actually put these ideas to economic models so that when the politicians are ready to sit down and discuss, we have basis to evaluate uh, uh, the, the value of these, of these ideas and how we can, we can include them in treaties, include them in, in, in agreements for, for the benefit of the two peoples or all thank, the people. Thank you all. Now, I know that we are at the end of the hour, but I feel this is a very rich conversation. I know some of you have to leave, so I, I want to thank you for attending, but I would like to, if we are allowed another five minutes, if everyone's okay with that, shall we, shall we continue? Great. Is it okay with you? Great. Okay, because we have um, quite a few questions regarding climate change. Um, for example, Beatrice Mosello uh, says, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the role of climate change impacts in the region uh, in terms of aggravating existing conflicts and disputes, um, as well as potentially constitu constituting an entry point for technical cooperation. Um, and there are several um, questions around climate change. So um, yes, maybe Aisha Goli would like yeah. to do it. Hi. Wonderful question to complement our discussion because we were about to mention the major issue in the region. So we were talking about the dams, we are talking about diplomatic relations, institutions, but there is this overarching problem of climate change and it is now, uh, it is now realized and it is certain uh, with the research that the climate change has a very negative impact on, on in the flow of Euphrates and Tigris. It's not only IPCC, but local researchers, local also research on the ground found, finds out that in the next couple of decades, there will be a very less amount of water in the mountains of Turkey, especially in the Euphrates uh, section, but all, as well as in Tigris as well. So they, they calculate like 25% of Euphrates will not be there, not, not in the long horizon, it will be in a couple of decades time. So it's, uh, it's a huge problem and we are living through the impacts of climate change, we recognize. Uh, we, there, there are frequent droughts, extreme droughts, and there are extreme events like floods as well. Even though we have these large dams, they are not helping us to control the floods. So it is in the region, in the basin full of dams that even flooding is a problem, but droughts is a common problem, but it is worse than usual. It's historically people used to live in droughts here in this region. It's an arid or semi-arid region, but it's, it is different. these droughts are different than the historical droughts. They come more often, they come more uh, heavy in magnitude. And as I already mentioned that Iraq has been living through a severe drought when Turkey decided to fill the newly constructed Ulusu Dam and Iraqi, Iraqi authorities asked Turkey to delay the filling of the dam and Turkish authorities agreed. This is a go good re example of diplomatic uh, achievement. 
And, and after this drought, uh, it was a wet year and Turkey started to peel the dam. So at the transponder level, they try and try to respond to the needs of the riparians and they try to band-aid the situation. But this, will, this cannot go on like this. I mean, the climate change impacts will be harsher and it will be very much felt all through the basin. So they need at, at national level, more concerned attention and uh, also more, um, implementation in terms of what to do with climate change. What I observed, the question was great. The climate change is a is really a really a very significant problem. But on the other hand, when the relations were good in the first decade of 2000s, when the officials were coming together either around the track two diplomacy or at the official level, uh, they, they had participated in trainings, which was also another sign of cooperation. They also figured out climate change uh, issue as a good area for cooperation, to learn from each other, to study what to do. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't reach a conclusion, but in the trainings, I noted that climate change became among the technocrats, among the uh, mid-level uh, decision makers, uh, with the contribution of the professionals and academics in the region, whenever they secured uh, time and atmosphere, they wanted to learn from each other how they are coping with climate change at national and regional levels. So the question was already con uh, already comprising this issue. It's a tr very much threatening factor. It's already a, a huge factor to be accounted for national and transponder water management, but it's also a factor which can bring together riparians, uh, because in the past, in the good days, it was a factor for cooperation. It, it was considered as a non-contentious issue. Can I follow Thank up? Thank you. Uh, you can, but I'm just, you can, but I'm gonna, because it's, it's, it's really the end, I wanted to ask you to each answer, and maybe you can come in with your comment then. So I wanted to ask each of you, because there is a lot of questions focusing on peace building and whether water can be used uh, to solve conflicts and also whether grassroots movements um, can help, you know, grass, uh, communities who share the river rather than uh, government level. So I thought I would pose those questions given that we're focusing on the peace building, not just, you know, as uh, maybe as an example for other regions, there's one person who's asked about, about Yemen too. So, um, so in a, on a more general level, um, maybe I can just ask each of you to, to make one comment really on where to start because I think it's been pointed out by many that the countries in the region have many other problems to deal with and uh, as, as Dr. Azam has pointed out the trust level is low so where ca where can one start? Oh, yeah can I say yeah. Yeah. yeah I was very inspired with civil society emerging in Syria during the Syrian unrest and then turned into uh, civil war so I believe uh, the next generation should be that building the confidence, building the, uh, building the practices among the civil society. So that there was always been a civil society in Syria, but it was very much suppressed. But it's it's uh, uh, ironically during the civil war, civil society tried to manage and to to manage the, its water resources as other livelihoods, and I believe. It's a very important starting point to bring together civil society groups all through this because stakeholder engagement, uh, national level and especially at transponder level is at very, very rudimentary stage. And I believe it should be supported uh, by the development agencies, by the United Nations system and by the riparian states that the civil society should strive and should really take the, take the significant role. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Esa? Um I am civil society. I run Nature Arab. I am yeah, grassroots. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, we exist. We are voiceless, uh, but uh, on the whole, sometimes ignored, sometimes uh, are listened to, but we do reach decision makers. What is preventing an agreement? I mean, decision makers that I have given my ideas to understand the value just the conditions are not yet available. Climate change may provide that push that politicians need. For Iraq, 
sea level, okay, so climate change, we really don't know how much water is going to happen, uh, how much rainwater. We know that there's going to be extreme events. We know that temperature in the region is going to increase, and we have that uh, ready. But we also know that, that the sea level is increasing. Sea level increasing means salt wedge penetration into Shat al-Arab, and we saw a preview of what can happen in Basra in 2018 when 110,000 people got poisoned from seawater uh, penetration. That is something that uh, Iraq definitely need to cooperate with Iran on either building a Thames barrage type regulator on the mouth of Shat al-Arab or coming to an agreement with the, the, the uh, Turkey uh, and Iran on allowing certain uh, environmental releases for the marshes, my marshes, as well as to, to keep the salt wedge uh, uh, at bay. The point is climate change is the cause of that rough road ahead that I'm talking about, but if we use our heads properly and smartly, we can convert it to an opportunity to create that cooperation that we need in order to manage the water resources of the basin together. Thank you. And Chanar, last word to you. Yeah, I mean, more or less, both Dr. Azam and Professor Kibarolu said the things that I will say, but I will basically add that maybe in addition to civil society's involvement, which is very, which would be very important for enhancing cooperation and trust in the region, I would also basically think like, I mean, more commitment to the uh, capacity building activities in the region to basically enhance those kind of uh, problems. I mean, as I said, I agree with both of the uh, professors, so it is what I can add. We need to concentrate on, on on using less water for agriculture. That could be also part of the solution, but that's details. We're getting it. We're getting. I, I would like to the thirty level, uh, thirty thousand foot level, to uh, talk about ideas as opposed to details of ideas. And I think you've all done really well at that today. You know, given the time limit, it's it's a pity. Actually, we really need more days. And I think actually we do have some next week. I think you are taking part in some more discussions on the same topic. Um, anyway, I just wanted to say thank you so much, really, to, to to each of you. I've seen in the questions, you know, many people thanking you and seeing the words excellent, illuminating, fascinating. So, um, so I think that that really expresses uh, uh, how how rich the discussion was and how grateful people were to you for, for put, putting aside your time and sharing your expertise. So with this, uh, I would like to, to close the meeting. Um, I do believe that your presentation is available to participants um, afterwards. And, uh, and let's hope that we um, see this situation um, improve over the next few years. <laughs>